Hello and welcome to the new Spiro podcast where we interview experts, authorities and characters on all things spearfishing. Come and join us after the show at noobspiro.com, the online spearfishing community helping you to become a better Spiro. Here are your hosts for the show, Shrek and Turbo. G'day Noob Spiro community, a little bit of a different intro today. It seems that somebody's actually listened to the podcast, so we've got a few people to thank. So just a quick shout out to Barnabas, A-Class, La Paisa, Fish Girl 69 and Dazza Dark. Thanks for supporting us guys, if you keep that up, it gives us more incentive to keep on making these things and helping out the noob. And just before I roll over to Shrek, I just want to say good day to Magnus over in Wellington. Mate, keep up the stoke and good luck over there in Hawaii, mate. And please send us an email and let us know how you go with your, your first spear fishing trip over there. Sounds awesome. Yeah, good day, Magnus. Hey, thanks for leaving us reviews on iTunes, guys. It helps us rank up and helps people find the show. So today, Noob Spiro, we're chatting with Luke Potts, a popular video and social media channel host from Aquatic Rehab. He lives and dives out of Auckland, New Zealand. Welcome to the show, Luke. G'day. How are you? Pretty good, mate. How are you? <laughs> good. That A-Class is a pretty hard case name. A-Class. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> biggest, biggest fan, apart from our good mate j He's our biggest fan. Fish, Fish Girl 69 was pretty classy too. I don't know who she is, but... Is this iTunes reviews, is it? Yeah. yeah. We've been getting a few, so thank you to those people. The so. dizzying heights of podcast celebrity status, it's, oh, it's out of control. That's tough. Oh, but we're in a supermarket and people are just like, is that Turbo from New Spiro? <laughs> and, uh, you know, like people are all looking around. It's like, wow. It's anyway, enough about it. <laughs> God, stop it. Stop it. Uh, so, is that Shrek? Yeah, no, it's, yeah, no, it's good. good to be talking to you guys, you know, like we've heard a lot. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Luke, so you live and dive out of Auckland, New Zealand, but where did you get started spearfishing and how long have you been doing it? I've been diving about seven years, which is about how long I've been with my missus for. So I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. About seven years out of Auckland and I actually started diving on the North Shore. I don't know if you guys have heard of the North Shore before. Yep, the North Shore but, of Auckland, yep. Yeah, it's basically just all yuppies. Like, yeah, it's just full of yuppies and it's like terrible visibility <laughs> and no good diving whatsoever. Okay. I actually started off like, because I didn't know anything about spearing and stubbies were the bloody, you know, like a belt with a pig knife on it. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> and I had a 100 centimetre immersion gun. Okay. That was my old man. Yep. And I used to just get in the water and shoot. It's like Perori. Have you heard of Perori? Yep, yep I've shot He plays yeah. cricket, doesn't he, for New Zealand? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a, <laughs> what do you call them? Like a, a lutterick or something like that. Yep, yep. yep. Blackfish, yep. Yeah, they're terrible. But I didn't know any better, so yeah, I was just smashing them for a few months until I sort of got the idea about what I was doing and actually got a decent spearfishing kit. So w- when you ate your first Perori, you didn't think it was terrible, though, did you? It was the best fish you'd ever eaten. No, nah, it was all right. It was just the smell filleting them, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Disgusting. You have to gut them in the water, those weed-eating fish, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So you were sort of like walking down in the water with a little gun, a pair of stubbies on and a pig and knife just past all the latte sipping yuppies on the North Shore and yeah, just yeah, coming yeah. back with a string of dead fish. Yeah, like Campbell's Bay and that and coming back <laughs> yeah. with bloody, yeah, like a string of perori and <laughs> nice. you know, wounded spotties and <laughs> a walk beach. One day I actually got out of the water and walked past my mum I remember her, because she lives in Torbay there, I remember her sort of shaking her head a bit. But, yeah, it's improved from there. <laughs> yeah. So how did it improve from there, Luke? Did you find a community of Sparrows? Did you find a mentor? How did you go about sort of improving from where you were there? I started going out with a bloke, a German fella called Ollie, who I still dive with, um, to an island called Terry. Okay. Off Auckland's Hauraki Gulf, and it's still reasonably close. Like You can see it from those North Shore beaches. Okay. Yeah, it's off the end of Fonga Praia, but it does actually hold really good fish. But I spent a few years learning the terrain there and sort of working in the terrible water for a long time, figuring out how to get close to fish and, and, and also how to hunt snapper as well. Yeah. So this guy that started taking you out, he had a nice boat, did he? 
Oh, no. Nah. Look, <laughs> he's still got the same boat. <laughs> like, we went out on it like two or three days ago and I took my mate out in it for the first time and he said it's possibly the worst boat. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a it's a shocker. Yeah. But, no, it does the job. Like, it'll crack open and sink soon, but it's still going. And he was the bloke that sort of taught me to like just equalize and actually try to dive down. Okay. You know? That's like a whole new thing when you're first starting out is going and shooting fish. So you had a pretty rough start. You didn't have a really good mentor, and then you finally got onto this guy with a terrible boat. And yeah, you got, yeah, yeah. You got out into some nice, dirty Auckland water. That's it. And so what What was your first memorable fish out there? Take us there um, on the day. Can you, can you remember mine? I did a few years learning out there, and I do remember coming over a ledge and just fluking a snapper probably about five kilo. And wow. I was over the moon. Like, oh, yeah. there's a lot of them out there now. I'm getting a lot of them. But back in the day, like, I was just spooking them left, right, and center um, yep. whenever I'd see them. And yeah, I got that fish. I still got a photo of that fish. And yeah, I just shooting and just saw the tail just shooting out into the murk and just happened to hit it. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. You took a pot shot. Hey. Yeah, well, I sort of I seen the tail cruising and I shot it where I thought it was. And yeah. from now on, I'm going to call that the pot shot. Yeah, yeah, right, mate. So that's that's your first memorable fish. Yeah. What about all that dirty water? You must have a scary moment that comes yeah. to mind. I watch a few of your videos, Luke. There seems to be bronzies everywhere all the time, and yeah. you shoot some high quality footage. We've seen the spearfishing North Island New Zealand 2015 video that you've put out recently, and. There's some cracker bronzies in there. Yeah, that's the other thing about Terry is that it's just littered with sharks. Mm. Like, I don't recommend shooting kingfish there anymore around the sharks because we've yeah. had some pretty good experiences. But we almost used to be able to count down, you know, until they come in. But the scariest one, the one that really, because I swam with a lot of sharks there and had fish taken quite a bit, but the one that really changed my whole view of it was this bloke from America, Nathan, he shot a kingfish and it was spined. So it was just vibrating on the yep. bottom. Uh, yep. And these two bronzies came in and they were just going mental, but they weren't like attacking it. They were just thrashing around on the reef. Yeah. And I dived down to have a look. It was quite murky and I, I'd, I'd never seen a shark do that before. It was just next to the vibrating fish. Just, it was almost hitting its tail on its head, like, wow. going, like rolling and flipping. And anyway, I went back to the surface and as I was talking to him, I said, that's just the sharks are just going crazy. I don't know what they're doing. This bronzy just flew up out of nowhere and smashed into him. Wow! And it came up so hard, and it hit the end of his muzzle, and he was just trying to fight it off, and it was just trying to break his guard, and it wouldn't stop. And wow. I went out to try to shoot it because I thought it was he was over, but I had line around me, yeah. and I thought I'm not going to do that. And then another shark came up and took over. It actually smashed into the gun. It smashed into the front of the other shark. Oh, and it wow. came in like a freight train and it smashed that other shark off and it took over. And it just, that one's just trying to break his guard now. When it turned, it took off with his gun. It had some, the rubbers and that caught around its head. And oh. We swam back to the boat so quickly and just ended up in a pile on, on this is Ollie's boat as well. And just hope from it sink. On, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. It was, he says, oh, I just, I've seen quite a lot of splashing. What's going on there? I says, Yo, Nathan almost died. So that was pretty gnarly. So, a lot of respect for them after that, too. Hey? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I've had something similar, nowhere near as bad as that, but I've been rushed by three of them with a new guy. I don't know why, but we were drifting over this reef. It was quite a fast drift in about 10 metres. Mm. I'm burling up a fish so this new guy can just kind of watch from the surface, crystal clear water on the day, and mm. I had Rainbow Runner coming in and in and out of the burley, and was, this guy was loving it. And then we come off the end of the um, drift and the, the bottom dropped out to you know 20 metres or something. And these three bronzies have come in and they were so aggressive. This poor guy, he's bolted back to the boat, abandoned me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Never mind the back-to-back -back kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> fighting them off, giving them a trick. He just booted for the boat and left me he's there. <laughs> yeah, it was scary, man. That guy ended up... You know, handing his gear and he didn't want a bar of it after that. And so it's right? unfortunate. Yeah, because sharks can be very intimidating. It's something about the bronzies. Oh, I talk, I've spoken to the, the bloke Pat Swanson who's got the New Zealand world record snapper. And he's done a lot of tropical work. He's got a lot of experience. And he says it's the only shark that's ever swum at him with its mouth open, you know, like ready to go. Yeah, right. right. And, yeah, it's really changed my opinions because I haven't swum with whites, but I've swum with tigers, bulls. Oceanic white tips and all your reefies and that, like your coral sea stuff and Galapagos and that. Yeah. And a lot of chumming and a lot of like fish being stolen. 
Yeah. And I've never had any experiences like with these bronzies. Mm. Yeah, well, we had a similar thing the other day. He was landing a kingy the other day from the boat because two came in hard. Yeah. And <laughs> I was still stuck in the water. That's where I was supposed to get out of the water where the sharks were going absolutely mental on the tinker. <laughs> and I'm like, mate, Thanks, I, Ollie. I, don't I, I don't know if I could do this anymore. Like, <laughs> you're leaving me in the water with these things. Yeah. So we, we kind of got a rule out there, and that is if you're going to shoot one, we're going to make a plan, you know. Yeah, but, yeah. And that's something that's really put me onto the snapper is that, you know, just ignore the kingies and try to, like, stay away from the drama, you know. Yeah. Well, okay. that, that does explain it because you do see kingies in your videos, but you're never pulling the trigger on them. Nah, I just thought you know, maybe you didn't like eating them or something like that, but it's the bronzies. Yeah, well, I mean, on all those up current ledges, like in a lot of the places I'm looking for snapper and that snapper live, you, you always see kingfish. So when you're learning that where to hunt and find fish, like those places, they're the hot spots. It's where fish want to be. And that's just a sign for me, you know, because you know that you can, if, if the tide's good in that, you can knock one at the end of the day if you want one. Yeah. But if you shoot a kingy out of a spot where there could be a snapper, there's all that commotion could bugger it up for you, you know? Okay. Uh, so yeah. it sounds like you had a bit of a, a rough trot getting started, Luke. You do a bit yeah. of hunting as well, though, so that would have lent well to finding fish. How did you kind of develop your technique? For spearfishing? Yeah, for hunting all your different various species in New Zealand there. Because did, did you actually get another mentor or...? What I did was I began to film for a um, spearfishing store in Auckland and I was a dedicated cameraman okay. for years. And I went overseas to Tahiti and Nui and um, we did the Chatham Islands as well and, and a lot of filming around locally. And what I found was that when you're not trying to kill a fish, you act very differently because you're trying to film it for as long as possible. Yeah. What I found that did was it changed the way I try to get close to fish, you know, like rather than chasing them and that, I'm trying to sort of, like with the big schools of kingies and that, like I'll swim away from them and swim down to the reef and try to make them curious and then get them to come into the camera. And I think it was the filming that really um, helped. And, and also the bow hunting, that taught quite a lot of patience. Yep. Like when's the right time to, to take the shot or try to make a move on fish, you know? Yep, yep. It changes all over the world, you know. Like I took my techniques to Aussie. I did a wee bit of diving in Aussie. I was quite busy working, but in Australia, like I'd like ignore the fish like I do over here and expect them to come to me, but they just leave. Yeah. It's like, oh, oh, okay, thanks. Like <laughs> I'm not going to try that technique anymore. I might have to try something else, you know. I think, you know, what you're talking about makes perfect sense and it's great advice for new guys and a few of the guys we've interviewed have said sort of the same yeah. thing. It's all about body language and, and being patient. I think but, Richard Leonard did a similar thing with the camera. He he found that his, his hunting technique really improved with that kind of thing as well. Mm. But, oh, yeah. It's, and because when you take footage back, you can look at it and you go, oh, I did this and the fish did that, you know. You can you can see it over and over again. So it's, it's, it's a really quick way to sort of learn how to hunt, you know. Mm. Arr! It's time to open the veteran's vault. Hey, it looks like Barnacle Bob's here, Turbo. <laughs> oh, you beauty. <laughs> uh, Luke, this is the part of the show where we do the Veterans Vault. We ask our special guests to take us deep into an area of spearfishing expertise that they'd like to share about. We call that the Veterans Vault. So today you mentioned a bit about your snapper expertise. So we'd love snapper to, trapper. We'd love to put you under the Noob Spiro grill about your snapper skills. All right. It took me years to learn how to, to hunt them. There's a few different techniques to it. Basically, there's what, what we call in NZ the snooping snapper, which is checking the, the ledges and the drops for fish that are sleeping at the base or just resting at the base. Okay. Or you can do like what we call ground baiting, which is quite often use our kinna sea urchin and, and smash them up in an area where we can actually approach the fish unseen yep. oh, nice. and get a shot. Like basically on those similar ledges where you'd find them, and approaching sometimes it's ideal with the sun over your back and and bits and pieces but yeah the rule of it is you, the fish can never see you you know okay and the good thing about that is that fish are quite distracted when they're feeding yep but you still have to be very cautious when approaching the burley like I, i've still spooked fish and i just have no idea how they knew that i was there but my technique is basically it's quite different to what a lot of guys do and it's i snoop until i find fish and when I see a fish over a ledge, what I'll do is I'll see if there is good terrain nearby to actually lay a burley. And what I've found is that I can pull that fish in 
to the burley, probably half an hour later, I normally leave it for a good period of time and I don't haunt the burley. Okay. Which is, I don't hang around the burley and I don't keep checking it because it's often they can see you from the surface if you're breathing up, out, back, behind it or whatever. And what that does is it pulls the fish in from the general area and then you can take the fish that you want to take. I do this because I'm filming Bear Fishing Snapper yeah. and I don't really have time to go out and check a thousand ledges and, and shoot, you know, the odd fish. I'd like, I like to sort of try to get the best on footage that I can. Yeah, okay. And yeah, and that it- technique has worked really, really well. One other thing about it is that like, I've been going out with a lot of divers since I got back in October and I think I've only seen a couple of snapper being shot by other blokes and they're all doing similar things, laying burlies as well. But you sort of got to know where to do it. Like I think it just comes with the time in the water. Okay. And it's sort of knowing where they live, like the like large, flat, sort of kelpy, deep areas. Like if they have a deep exit or if you see good snapper sign, like smaller fish lurking around an area – or, or one fish over a ledge, then you generally know that that's going to be a good area. You're looking for like a nice ledge that sort of drops off in the deeper water where they can sort of smell the burley or whatever, and they, they come up out of that deep water to feed around that ledge. Is that, is that right? Yeah, like, and normally a ledge for me would be I want to see them top down so that they can't see me at all with really good kelp stalk cover and, yeah, like a straight ledge down. And to kelp, like, uh, like often flat sandy ground or barren rocky ground, you don't really find them. You can, but they really like the kelp forest. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, like uh, say if you have a series of ledges, you'd want to, the one that's the furthest out into open water, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Because, you know, they're not going to travel up into the shallows for a burley unless they're already right there. And also bait fish, kingfish, things like that, that's a good sign. And then when you're diving your reefs for your pelagics, it's a good technique to hunt wherever you're hunting in, in the North Island just to check over those ledges every time you're hunting, you know. That's some good stuff. That's Pretty a rich good. little now, fishing as well. Now, there. Have, you, have you shot <laughs> snapper in Oz when you were here? No, I've seen one. I did a lot of diving in southeast Queensland. Yeah. I've seen a few around the Nine Mile Reef and that, but I didn't do this technique because up there is very different diving. Like you're doing a drift dive. Yeah, we're sort of with the snapper. You're sort of coastal. You set your burley. You can leave and muck around and come back. With say like your nine mile reef off off Tweed and that. Like for me, lay a burley and then actually go and find it without getting busted again. It would be quite hard yards. Yeah, but yeah, it's very very different. And the thing is, is that like our snapper in New Zealand, they're only in a very small area of the country. Like it's sort of the upper one third of the country. Mm. And if you compare that coast size to Australia, like it's just tiny. You know. Mm. So I think there's obviously an area in Australia where it's quite dense populations of snapper, but I think they're relatively scattered up through the coast of New South Wales and Queensland. So they become far more easily uh, spread. Well, the, yeah, and they're rare, you know, like over here, like it's just luxury to have that kelp cover. It's, it's quite forgiving in terms of if you bugger your fish up, you can come back next week and try again and try again and try again. Mm. And it really helps you learn them. Okay. Because like a lot of blokes come over from overseas and they're in Wellington and they go, oh, I'm going to go look for a snapper. And it's like, we, we don't even have Kiwis shooting snapper down there, you know. Mm. We've only seen a couple come out of there recently and, and, and the South Island's just, it's, it's hardly ever heard of, you know. No snapper in the South Island at all. No. They, they do line catch them, eh? But like, it's just, they're just so rare, you know. So in terms of how far you're traveling from Auckland to the South Island, like if you compare that to the coast of Australia, it's it's nothing. It shows you that the dense populations, you know, they're not so widespread. I remember talking to a bloke, James Saker, is it? Saker? Yep. Yep. Um, and he, he shot a few good fish in the in the northern New South Wales there, and he showed me a video of him coming over a ledge. And I'm not sure if he laid a burley, but he had a bloody great white come in on it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's probably a bit of a put off as well. Because I have heard that in South Aussie there, you do have great whites following the snapper migration or the spawn or whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah that would make it pretty interesting is the old bronzies. And one thing too is like a few guys do use like your fish burley and that, which is, is great. But the chance of a shark coming and taking it is 80%, you know, if you've got it on one of those ledges. You've got to really time it right if you want to do that. Okay. Cool, no, yeah. thanks for that. Luke, that's a that's a great veterans vault. Well, I'm sure our audience will get something <laughs> well, out of that. I, a- I just have one more question, mate. For us here yeah. in, in Oz, you guys are using Kinner flat out, all right? Yeah. So if there's no urchins around, what would you recommend as your second choice of go-to burley for snapper? Oh, good question. I would use an oily fish. Like if you have snapper in an area and you have a straight ledge and you chum, like if you cube an oily fish, onto the ground so a shark can't actually steal it and leave with it or a big snapper can't leave with it 
So it's all in pieces. And you leave it for 15 minutes or, or 10 minutes so it's not all gone. If there's a fish in the area, the chances of it coming in are, are quite high. Mm. Yeah, like I did the same thing the other day. I just cubed up a, a small oily trevelli and I had a 16-pound snapper and a, a big ray and, and a bronze whale all doing bloody cartwheels on it. Wow. And I just had to – and just move and just top down. And what you find too is that if you've got more than one fish or if you've got a shark there, the, the snapper distracted by it. It's another big object moving. Yeah. And that really gives you an edge, you know, like if you're just by yourself and you're coming down onto a snapper top down in open water, you'll never get near them. Mm. Yeah. You know, if they're too busy looking at other big animals and, the, and, and, and a other big snapper too, they're not as quick to catch on. Mm. Right. It's one of those things, you know, like uh, when I was diving in the coral sea, I had blokes telling me, you know, like I, I show a photo of me with a couple of big snapper and like, oh, yeah, but NZ snapper's easy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. Uh. I must be a crap sparrow, mate, because it took me three or four years to learn how to just how to start targeting them. You know, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll stick and, with it. Yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> and there, but there's blokes out there that, that aren't on social media that are getting some amazing fish. You know, mm. yeah. And I think this summer is probably the first time that I can say that I can consistently hunt them after seven years of diving. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think they're any easier to hunt in New Zealand. I did a little bit of stuff when I lived back there, but mostly with a Hawaiian sling and. Yeah. yeah, we didn't even see him. So. Mate, I'd love to see you shoot a snapper with a Hawaiian sling. Oh, with a, yeah. With a well, that's actually pose. been the plan because there's a bloke here we, we call the snapper whisperer, uh, Reed Quinlan, who he shot 20-pound snapper with a Gatku, uh, like an eight-footer, I think. Wow. Spear. That, for me, that's the whole next level to hunting is becoming getting that close to them, you know? Mm. Same with, like, your kingies and bits and pieces. and I what think that that'll be the next thing, you know? Yeah, mate, I'd love to see that. And I just wanted to ask you, because they are such a flighty fish, what's your opinion on camo? Like, it, it, does, would it make any difference at all? No, nah, it doesn't matter what you wear, to be honest. Like, just stubbies. Ma- stubbies yeah. in, a, in a pig just knife. Stubbies, mate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah big beer gut and all that. <laughs> um, one thing I, I forgot to mention was I use a real gun. I will not use a float line because if you've got the current going the other way, you, you have your float line going out over the fish. Okay. And that, that might not spook them, but it's enough for them to look up and then, you know, they're looking up at something they're already sort of halfway onto you. So the, the, the real gun, and also if you're diving those over those steep ledges and you've got current in that, you can come up in different areas and you're not going to get caught in the weeds and things like that. So it makes it a lot easier. And then in terms of camouflage, I know a few blokes who have shot them just l- super long bottom times lying in the weed. Mm. But I still think that they're not seen. I think that all they are is a head popped out and the snapper feels some vibration on the lateral line sensors, yep. moves in, it just comes too close. Okay. But yeah, all my fish never saw me. So it's just, you're just a head popping over with a gun. Mm. That's it. I, I think what everything we've talked about today is it, it's an advanced level of spearfishing, like not using a float line is something that a lot of the experienced guys do with time in the water. And, and same with, yeah. with burley, I don't think it's a good good technique for guys just starting out. But as, as people progress, like these are techniques that become available, but they wouldn't be something you'd recommend to, to new guys? No, because like when we're hunting snapper, like when I, where I'm using a reel is, is relatively shallow water. Yep. And you're not diving with other people. It's it's a totally different ball game to like your, your free dive hunting, if you know what I mean. It, you're there, you're doing quick dives, you're looking over the ledges. And sometimes the dives can become relatively long if you're waiting for the fish to come in on the right spot. For like your weed lining and all your other work, like you still need a float line and all the rest of it. And it's just one of those things, eh? Like I've had a few pretty gnarly experiences with trying to hunt them deep as well. And you want to have a line down there to leak. The other blokes know where you're going to be. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, it's just one of those things, eh? And and also, quite a few blokes have been asking me, like new fellas have been getting straight onto reels. Yeah. And I shoot all my kingfish with a reel as well. Yeah. And I think that that's something you really have to learn because I have had my fingers wrapped up and been dragged around in bits and pieces. So you really got to know your gun. Yeah, just talk quickly about, say, a few of the hazards with reels because I've been around them a fair bit so, and I've been spearfishing a while, so I'm aware of it. But for a lot of the guys in the audience, they're not probably not quite aware of some of the things that can go wrong with a real gun. So what would you say to a new guy about some of the hazards of it? Well, I use a, a rife reel now. It's, it's really pricey, but it's, it's a really good reel. Yep. And the, the reason why I got it was because it's so reliable because my last reel fell off my freediver's gun while I was fighting a kingy. 
Mm. And then I bloody, that was a nightmare. <laughs> and I used to have to wind it in with my hand. Look, as you can see, I've had some pretty good gear over the years. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, I, I actually had one of the really old original plastic Picasso reels. That was my first reel I ever had. Yeah. And I remember I shot a, like a good sight, it was my first big mackerel, and it ran so hard, it was plastic. The actual Dyneema cut through the line guide oh, because nice. it was just a plastic reel, and the whole thing was flexing at any time. I think if you flicked it, it would have just shattered into a million pieces. It was <laughs> it was that flimsy. I think maybe yeah. it was set up for, for sniping little brim or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's just the thing. And I remember I shot a kingy of Terry back in the day, and I thought I had killed it, but it was just shocked. This is like 20 mil and a 7.1 and I must have hit it near the brain. Anyway, I went up to it to try to grab it in the water and it woke up again <laughs> and just went nuts and it just sped off into the distance and the real line had wrapped around my two uh, fingers wow. and I couldn't get it off and I was just getting dragged down mm. and eventually I managed to pop it off because it was sort of caught on the, the glove. Yep. Yep. And that was a real wake up. It's like if I couldn't have got that off or it had sort of nodded a bit differently. Like you can't do anything. You don't have time to pull your knife out and cut the line and that. You mm. just blow your eardrums and you, you just hope someone can help you. Yeah, so yeah. with the rifle, reel, it's really nice. So I just sort of hold the line onto the teak on the gun as I'm coming up and just put heaps of pressure on. Okay, But it's like you have to be so line conscious, eh? Yeah, and even float line conscious, you know, like that's one thing that I think for the new blokes, like you do your apprenticeship with your, your fifteen meter float line mm. until you know it so well that you're never getting tangled. You always got your line under control, and you're comfortable landing those big fish. And then move on to a reel and see how you go. You know? That that's great advice, Luke. What comes to mind when people start talking about reels is that it adds another layer of complexity to your spearfishing. And when you're starting out, you're flat out just friggin. <laughs> Not getting yeah. tangled in your float line, let alone using a reel and, and a yeah, dive so watch and all this other stuff that just seems to be clutter when you're starting yeah. out. And that, yeah, that's it. That fine line on a reel line just loves getting caught up in your knife, in your watch, mm. in your mask, like the whole lot. Yeah, nightmare, yeah that's it. You see a lot of new blokes coming out with like the best suits out and the bloody the reels and the dive watches too, you know. It's like... I've just thrown my dive watch away. I just don't use it anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm just listening to myself, which a dive watch is great for your surface intervals and stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah, I find that. I'm giving it more surface interval than than, than is normally required oh. until I actually feel the right to go back down again. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's that. It's just one of those things, you know. It's like the, you see the blokes using them and then you add the complexity to it and that's how you get in trouble with it. You just line everywhere. And I've got mates who, they're such good sparrows, you know. Like, I'm jealous of how well they can hold their breaths. And they just use a, a 20, 25-meter line with a basic gun, you know, and they're just shooting everything under the sun. Mm, mm. And even in the tropics, you know. So it goes back to the Indian, not the arrow. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. Moving on to the next bit of the show, Luke, what's the funniest thing you've experienced out spearfishing? Oh, what comes to mind? <laughs> Recently, this is actually another sharky one. <laughs> we went out to Little Barrier. I've got footage of this. This was in February. And we had one new bloke who had he'd never seen a shark before and he'd never shot a kingy. And every time I go out, I see sharks, like 80, 80% of my dives, I see sharks. And for some reason, everyone that comes with me sees sharks every time as well. And <laughs> I've got a reputation for it, but I don't know what. Maybe, maybe they like following you and Ollie's boat. They just know yeah. they're going to get a free meal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Before he got in the water, this bloke, David, I says, don't worry, mate, you'll see one today. And I went and, and did some mucking around and I come back and, and, and then the skipper said, oh, yeah, um, David saw a shark as soon as he hopped in the water. <laughs> I said, oh, well, there you go. Anyway, came to the end of the day and we got on this reef to try to get David his first kingfish and it was super clean and we had three big bronzies lurking around, like three males. And that was strange because it was all males that I'd seen that day and I don't know if they're more hyped up than females or what. And I don't know what's going on there, but one of the blokes shot a butter and then these three boys were like doing what you say, all back to back with guns out. One of them was talking about how he was going to abandon everyone and run, run, run. <laughs> <laughs> And I was swimming around with them. I was just saying, just relax, you know, like I'm trying to get footage. You know, instead of having your guns poke fully out, bring your guns back in. The sharks were just chilled out at that time. Anyway, with all the commotion, this real big kingy just come in mid-water. I heard one of the blokes screaming. It would come in actually top water, broadside along. I'd dive under one of them and just smashed it way too high 
And it's like, this is my rule that I'm preaching. Don't shoot king eats around sharks and yeah, I go yeah. break it. Because, you know, the big deep grooves in the head and the little eyes on a big kingy, you know, like I just can't resist it. Yeah, mm. yeah. I got dragged over the reef and I, these <laughs> blokes, like this is on a reel. It had 25 meters of line out and the kingy was on the sand and it was dragging me for... I turned the camera on halfway and I think about about eight minutes of footage. So it would have been dragging wow. me for over 12 minutes. Wow. It was real good fish. Like Anyway, the blokes were finning like to keep up with me and their sharks were sort of just lurking around in the outskirts. Yeah. And I got it up into midwater finally and it got bald like what you see out in the coral sea with the dog tooth and that. Like, it was like a flower of sharks like, and the sharks were the petals coming off. You know? Wow. There was about eight of them. And they were all big. <laughs> and these boys were just, you know, like, I, I was pretty afraid too, you know. Because like, <laughs> once they finished devouring the kingy, uh, this giant frenzy just going absolutely mental, they all came up at us. Oh, no. And we had sharks left, right, and center. <laughs> and these boys. And I dived down to prod one. There was two. And one come up right at my fin that one of the boys poked. And then I was, I, I'd just done a duck dive and one flew up over my head. <laughs> so it's like in about like two meters of water, it comes right up over my head. And you get in the footage, you can actually see the bubbles going past it. Oh, I was wow. screaming for the boat. We get back on the boat. And the funny part was, <laughs> we had one of the blokes on the phone to his wife straight away. And he's going, I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> and I look, back at, I look back over at the fellow that had never swum with sharks before. Yeah. And he was smoking a cigarette that he'd pinched off the bloody <laughs> skipper. And he's going, Mate, I gave up smoking a long time ago. And he goes, I thought you were just going to give us an intro to sharks, you know. Yeah. Not a bloody, you know, absolute frenzy where they come and turn Baptism on us. So. By fire, yeah. it sounds like yeah. a, like an African safari with the lions yeah. all surrounding <laughs> yeah, the vehicle. Yeah. Thanks, Luke. Oh, oh, it was like, so hard case, man. Like, how's, uh, how's the group? Have they really bonded over this experience? You know, traumatic sort of experience. I haven't seen any of them since. <laughs> <laughs> I keep asking him to go out. Like, he's yeah. got a lovely boat, you know. He's probably going to listen to this. So, hopefully, we can go out soon, Devin. <laughs> <Hopefully>, um, <laughs> You've got a dedicated boaty anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, well, that was a pretty hard case, so a bit of interesting stuff. But looking back over the footage, you know, like they all came up at us. I think we're just a, another vibration in the water and it's obvious we don't stink like fish and we don't set off their prey drive, you know. Yeah. yeah. But they're just looking for that next meal and I think their metabolism, you know, is, is so much energy to power such a big animal. Yeah. So when they commit to feeding, they have to get the food, you know. Mm. So, yeah, that was good for a laugh. Oh, shit, mate. All right, there's a knock on the door, mate. I think it's time oh. for Pedro. Is that Pedro? It's Pedro. Here he is. Take it away, Pedro. Cool. See, it's time for Noob Spiro's Fast Five Facts. Ay, ay, ay. See. <laughs> All right, dude. Well, that's Pedro, mate. So the Fast Five Facts for Noobs is uh, where you give us your top five pieces of advice for a new guy starting out spearfishing. All right, okay. Back to what I said before, the Indian, not the arrow. That's a really big thing for me. Like, you see so many blokes going out there and they've got, like, you know, six different spear guns and it's all about the gear, you know? And my thing is it's about the hunter. I know blokes like Dwayne Herbert. He's, you know, multi-New Zealand spearfishing champion. And I asked him what he uses and he doesn't even know. Like, he's just, he's, oh, what rubber size? What are you talking about? Like, rah, rah, rah. And he's shooting 40 kilo kingies with a bloody, I think it was a 110 or something out of the three kings. And Wow. It, what it comes down to, I think, instead of, you know, just get a piece of equipment that you've been told is going to do the job, like, you know, your 120, whatever for New Zealand, and just go and hunt. Like, go and try to learn fish and try to get close. That's the thing, because that's the only way that you can become a better hunter. So, Indian or the arrow, don't yeah. chase fish is a big thing for me. I take out a lot of guys. This this is more so for the kingfish. You get schooled on the surface by a big school of kingies and NZ. Rather than going down and chasing them where they think, oh, crap, this thing's coming after me. It's showing signs of being a predator. Where they kind of leave and you get an average shot on a fish as it's leaving. What I recommend is diving down through the school and just letting them come. Even if there's structure like reef below you and you're comfortable to get down to it. What I'll often do is just dive through the school, go down onto the reef and wait. And eventually they just come past so close. And that gives you the chance to put the best shot on a fish and also take the fish that you want. Cool. So... Don't chase them. 
Yep. And also for the third one, I'd say take the time to observe fish, you know, take the time to sort of watch what they do rather than just getting all excited and killing them, if you know what I mean. It's all part of it, you know, like eventually you're going to have to do it sooner or later. Take time to actually just watch the species and take the time to watch good sparrows and how they hunt because everyone seems to have quite a different style. Yep. Mm. So it's quite good to sort of take it in. Like, And I'm still doing it with really good divers. A few South African divers that have come over that are just ridiculously deep divers. Yeah, that have a few really good techniques. Yeah, relax is probably yep. a huge thing because what I've noticed lately is a lot of guys like screaming on the surface, kangies or a big snapper or like you know like you're screaming. Like, I, I don't know if I screamed on the surface, I don't know how long it would take me to get ready, like get ready to actually have a dive and try to shoot a fish. Yeah, mm. true. You'd never hear them telling the other boys where the fish are ever. <laughs> so yeah, there's no true. problem with us. It's just silence. <laughs> Yeah, someone's yeah, getting the, towed around in a circle and he's just like, I don't want to let the other guys know about this. <laughs> and that's the thing is don't let the buck fever take over, you know, you, you can fight it. But it's it's very hard when you start, like we've had it in the coral sea too, he had a um, giant dog tooth on the flasher as, as it was getting dark and one bloke just screaming and then going down and just taking the pot shot, you know. And if everyone was relaxed, the outcome could have been quite different, you know. Yeah, okay, cool. And dive often. The only way to really learn hunting underwater is time in the water hmm. that's all i can say like and same with bow hunting you go online and you ask questions and you you go where are the snapper and how do i do this and where are these fish and radio are and then you get in the water and you forget everything because it's an environment you have to learn for yourself yeah all right so just quickly i got india not the arrow so focus on developing your technique and not spending thousands of bucks on gear two don't chase fish dive down relax watch your body language number three was take time to observe so study the species you're spending time hunting number four relax calm down don't ruin your relaxation and number five was just get out and following up those pieces of advice mate what's a crucial piece of kit that the noob needs to get or get a handle on Look, I spent a bit of time thinking about this and the only thing that I can really find that has been quite good for me was a, a low volume mask with good peripheral vision and because I've spent a lot of time looking around, especially yeah. when I've got sharks coming up behind me and good low volume, like I think it sort of makes the dives easier on yourself when you don't have to refill a big mask full of air yeah. and um, you can equalize easily and it just sort of helps that transition to... So how do you pick your mask? Do you just go into the dive shop and just work with the dive retailer to sort of pick one out? Yeah, well, most of the dive retailers will know. And if blokes just go in and say, I want a good, like a low volume mask, I personally use the Technus or the Aqualine micro mask. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know quite a few blokes that are using it with different face shapes and it's been really good for them. But we've all got big beards and moustaches now, so it's hard to test a, test a, a, a mask in the store because you're always sucking air and through the mo. <laughs> yeah, like obviously that suck on test and make sure it's comfortable on you because a lot of fellas get like the forehead squeeze with the pressure and bits and pieces. So just a mask that fits, you know, and is, is really comfortable for you. All right. Hey, Luke, with our audience, we're, we're starting to get a few listeners now. I think we might have five or six or something. Is there anything you'd like them to do? I mean, obviously, they can get on YouTube and check out your channel, Aquatic Rehab. Yep. And you're on Facebook as well. You, you got over 3,000 likes on this. You're getting some popularity. Yeah, it's just bumped up recently. I was actually surprised that you guys got hold of me because it seems like the videos have sort of traveled a wee bit. It's good. Yeah. Which is it's quite cool. So if people want to check out Aquatic Rehab TV on Facebook, they can search that and people can... Ask me what they want to see from New Zealand or mm. what they want to see in videos. That would be really good because I'm running out of ideas. I quite agree have TV on YouTube if you want to see the spearfishing videos. I tell you what, I wouldn't mind watching a South Island tour. Mm. Yeah. Well, and what we were doing was making a plan to go target some southern species with a pole spear. Cool. Oh, cool. Awesome. Hey, man, just we've got this bloody hurricane bearing down on us. Now, I see so that, yeah. We'll have to see. Mate, when I, I was over there a couple of years ago and I just had some flush and chups and I actually had some blue cod. Oh, what, yeah, yeah. Can you shoot that thing? What is that fish? I, I don't oh. know. It tasted awesome. Yeah, they're like a southern fish, a colder water fish, mm. and you can smash them. They're just so dumb. They come up and bite the end of your spear. So quite often you shoot them down the mouth. That's my it. kind of fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I think we'll be shooting down in Wellington and that. We see a few up here, like deeper, but they're never really of size. Yeah. But yeah, no, they're a big target fish for Spiros because they're just such a good eater. Levi, I think if he lived yeah. in New Zealand, he'd be shooting red mochi and blue cotton oh, three, yeah. three to four metres. That, that'd be him. <laughs> I don't know what 
red mokia, but if they're as easy as blue cod and they eat as good, I'd be smashing them all day. That's unreal. <laughs> nah. Uh, there's like a bit of a thing going on about not shooting red mochi in New Zealand. I've, I've got mates who, who have like a little Facebook group called Red Mochi Hunters New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for taking the piss. But um, yeah, no, like if you, you guys start on them and that, they're, they're pretty prolific, but it's just one of those fish that's just so easy, you know. Yeah. And and I also heard a rumour the other day that if you shoot one, the partner will go up, the, up on the reef and, and, and wait until it dies of sadness because oh. the other one's been killed. So... Yeah, so if you believe that, you probably so you, so you could probably <laughs> so, so, yeah. so you could potentially find the partner quite easily in shallow water and knock her <laughs> off as well. Yeah, just kill her. <laughs> or you could just go and get, and get her once you've um, um, committed suicide yourself. Or, yeah. But yeah, we, we do have a blue mochi, which is a very good eating fish as well. Okay, and a southern fish. You can see them on that North Island spearfishing thing. I don't know if you saw. I, I shoot a couple of them in the brain, based, only because they're five centimeters off the spear tip. Like. Mm, okay. Very, very placid, and they don't care when you shoot the other ones. They just oh, no flight work. response. I love that. Yeah, <laughs> Surgeon but, fish do that. Yeah, which oh. is good. That's why I want to get them on the pole spear. So, all right. Well, I'm looking forward to your next round of videos. Look, so we'll look you up on Aquatic Rehab TV. So, thanks for coming on the show. I really enjoyed the snapper section. I, I hope our audience did too. So, yeah, thanks. Yes, thanks for talking to us, mate. Thanks for listening today, Noob Spiro. If you'd like to find out any more information from today's guest, then head over to noobspiro.com. We really appreciate you guys as listeners. Without you, we couldn't do the show. So if you want to help us out, leave us a review on iTunes or head on over to noobspiro.com and uh, sign up for our newsletter. We won't send you crap. So that's all from us. A big hooroo. We hope to see you soon. Shrek over and out.